Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. Fall is right around the corner, and so is candle season. If you can't wait to get your hands on your favorite pumpkin spice candle, maybe you should think again. Have you ever stopped to think about what ingredients are in a fragrance candle? The Fair Packaging and Labeling Act gives fragrance manufacturers a trade secret status so they legally do not have to share their ingredients with you. Synthetic fragrance can contain up to 3,000 different chemicals, some of which are endocrine disruptors and respiratory irritants. Some even contain chemicals that are known carcinogens. If you do not want to give up false scented candles forever, I have a swap for you. Introducing Fontana Candle Company. I love Fontana Candle Company for their 100% natural and independently certified non-toxic candles, wax melts, and room sprays. They use only pure beeswax, coconut oil, and essential oils in their candles, and they put all of their ingredients right on the label. Fontana was the first candle to be certified non-toxic by Made Safe, and they now have over 75 products certified. This includes their natural bath soaks, bar soaps, wax melts, and room sprays too. I love that they have my favorite seasonal scents like cinnamon orange clove, peppermint twist, and spice latte. Discover your favorite non-toxic scent by heading over to their website. Use J.I. Podcast as your code at FontanaCandleCompany.com for 15% off your order. That's Fontana, F-O-N-T-A-N-A, Candle Company, Dot com and use code J-I podcast. Ben Bickman earned his PhD in bioenergetics and was a postdoctoral fellow with the Duke National University of Singapore in metabolic disorders. Currently, his professional focus as a scientist and professor at Brigham Young University is to better understand the role of elevated insulin in regulating obesity and diabetes, including the relevance of ketones in mitochondrial function. Welcome back to the show today. I'm really excited for our guest it is Dr. Ben Bickman. And you guys, when I asked, who do you guys want back on the show? So many of you said, Dr. Bickman, he did so awesome with the insulin resistance. We want to learn more from him. And so he is back. And so thank you, Ben, for being here today. My pleasure. Yeah, I had a wonderful time the first time. And if people thought it was helpful, then let's make it helpful again. Yes, I agree. Okay, will you tell my listeners, though, maybe those that haven't listened to the first one, just a little bit about yourself and who you are? Yeah, of course. First and foremost, I'm a husband and father, but no one ever wants to get me on their show to talk about my parenting tips. So we'll put that to the side for a moment. I am a research scientist and professor of cell biology at BYU. And as a scientist, my focus is, I could describe it a number of ways, but I study human metabolism with a strong focus on fat cells. And then zooming into the cell even further, I focus on the mitochondria, the so-called powerhouse of the cell. That's how we all learned about it in, in you know, high school biology. So that's the part of the cell that takes things like fats and glucose and ketones and burns them for energy. That is the sort of central nexus when it comes to a cell, I guess, famous spot of metabolism within a cell. And that means that I've become an expert on things like obesity and diabetes and even some unexpected things that people wouldn't associate with metabolism, like, for example, Alzheimer's disease and infertility. Wow, you are so knowledgeable, know so much. So I'm really excited today to talk to you because we're going to talk about fat metabolism, how fat is affecting different things like infertility, things like that. But I actually want to talk about metabolic syndrome first, which has to do with that. That term metabolic syndrome is being talked about a lot on social media, things like that. But I don't know if people exactly understand what that all entails. So can you just explain what metabolic syndrome is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, metabolic syndrome as a brief preamble is a nice way to define metabolic health. So I hate to bring in another term, but you know, people will often invoke metabolic health or poor metabolic health. And looking at that through the lens of the metabolic syndrome is a nice way to frame a conversation. Now, the metabolic syndrome is well-defined by 
the World Health Organization and these big kind of medical entities. And it is viewed as a cluster of complications, specifically five particular problems that, as I said, tend to cluster together. If you get one, you usually are getting the others to some degree. And they are in no particular order. One, having too much central fat. So the waist circumference is higher than it should be. And then two, having high blood pressure. Three, having high blood glucose. And then the last two are both blood lipids or, or a different way of measuring kind of cholesterol and fats in the blood. And that is high triglycerides and low HDL cholesterol, which often can be just combined into one term called dyslipidemia. Uh, but those five things, which tend to come together, are the definition of the metabolic syndrome. And to take it one step further, it's having three of the five. Based on conventional clinical care, person has that ratio of the five, then they would be defined as having the metabolic syndrome. And then just one last comment on that is that the metabolic syndrome, while it is worth studying, it is worth talking about because it's so common, as a scientist, I, of course, love precision, and, and I think it's noteworthy for the audience to hear that what we call the metabolic syndrome used to be called the insulin resistance syndrome. Mm. When this cluster of complications was first identified by a scientist named Gerald Reven, who's famous in the realm of diabetes research, which is to say nobody knows who he is at all, because <laughs> what scientists are ever famous? He called it the insulin resistance syndrome because it is a better term. It is actually the trunk from which all of these branches are coming. It is the common root cause. And so calling it the insulin resistance syndrome is more descriptive. It helps us understand the actual origins. It just doesn't sound as good. But regardless of what we want to call it, that is the definition of the metabolic syndrome, those five problems. Thank you for explaining that. And I'm assuming, well, I'm sure it is, it's becoming more and more trendy on social media because this is becoming a growing concern in America, correct? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, just to put things in perspective, I travel extensively. Uh, for example, now after this will have been released, but tomorrow, our time here as we're recording this, I leave to give some talks in Switzerland. And then a couple weeks after that, I'll be giving a talk in Vietnam. And then a week after that, I'll be giving a talk in Turkey. Wow. So this is very much a global problem. And as much as we, particularly in the U.S., are quick to criticize the U.S., we are neither the fattest, nor are we the most diabetic, nor are we the most prevalent with metabolic syndrome. There are countries around the world in South Asia and Southeast Asia and the Middle East that are much worse than we are. So this is very much a global problem. But... To put a fine point on it, a study was published about five years ago that found that within the United States, 88% of adults were considered metabolically unhealthy because they had at least one of the five cluster of problems of the metabolic syndrome. So only 12% of adults were free and clear from any sign of the metabolic syndrome, or to say that another way, were free and clear of any sign of insulin resistance. Wow. That is really high. I would not have expected that to be so high, nor would I expect it to be a global issue because you always hear about Americans, you know, the Americans yeah, with their do. poor diet and their poor health. So that's really interesting. Thank you for talking about that. So I actually want to talk to you about fat on this show and so and how fat is a problem or deals with or an issue for metabolic problems. So Let's start at the beginning. What is fat tissue and how does it actually relate to metabolic problems? Right. That is a very appropriate place to start because I believe that most metabolic problems start in the fat tissue. Now, people listening may roll their eyes and say, well, of course it does, Ben. We all know that if you get fatter, your metabolic health is suffering. But that's actually not quite the consensus that most people think, although I appreciate the common sense approach. Within the biomedical realm of my field of research, there's tremendous debate of whether it's the fat tissue that is the first to fall, if you will, or whether it's the muscle or whether it's the liver or a handful of other organs. But I very much embrace the fat first focus that I believe that it is the fat tissue that is the first to become problematic. And this is because of how the fat cell grows, not so much how much fat a person has. And there's a, a perhaps a subtle, I hope, not too subtle of a difference between what I'm saying. In other words, let's imagine, to make this just really simple uh, and clear, let's imagine two different people. 
and they're old college roommates and they haven't seen each other for 10 years and they get together 10 years later and they're both 40 pounds fatter than they were before, which is not at all uncommon nowadays in many countries around the world. Um, however, one of them is just simply 40 pounds fatter, while the other is also 40 pounds fatter, and he has diabetes, and he has high blood pressure, and he has low testosterone, you know, and, and, and suffering from infertility. The difference between them, among any slight other possible differences, is the size of their individual fat cells. So the first fellow, who is simply fat, but otherwise pretty healthy, which is possible, albeit not common, that is the kind of individual who has a, the ability to continue to make more fat cells. That's a process called hyperplasia. So he has fat cell hyperplasia. In other words, as he is eating a diet that is spiking the hormone insulin and giving him enough calories to fuel this fat growth, every time his fat cells get a little big, it simply multiplies or, or replicates and produces a new fat cell. So each individual fat cell is pretty modest in size. It's only a little bigger than it was originally, and there are just a lot more of them. But each individual fat cell is healthy and insulin sensitive and working well. In contrast, the other roommate who now is also 40 pounds fatter, but suffering all of these problems in his body, and this is how most people get fat. Most people get fat this way, which is a limited number of fat cells. Typically, once we exit adolescence, which is mid to late teens in women or around 20 or early 20s in men, men are several years later in that regard, then the number of fat cells we have is typically pretty set. And at that point, then any further fat gain, as is happening in this fictitious individual, is the result of each individual fat cell getting substantially larger. And it is substantial. There is no cell in the human body that is capable of this much growth wow. where the fat cell can get 10 or 20 times bigger volumetrically than it was in its sort of natural native state. And so this is a significant increase. And then two pathogenic or harmful things will happen within this hypertrophic or really fat fat cell. The first one is that the hypertrophic fat cell becomes resistant to the hormone insulin, or in other words, insulin resistant. And that is because insulin has a constant signal to the fat tissue to grow and grow and grow. In fact, just to really put an exclamation mark on this, it is utterly and totally impossible for the human body to gain fat mass without insulin being elevated, or to say that another way, for fat tissue to grow, insulin must be elevated. There can be no exception to that rule. If someone has low insulin, it is utterly and totally impossible for fat cells or for fat tissue to grow. So nevertheless, back to the hypertrophic fat cell, it's beginning to reach a point of maximum dimension that the membrane of the cell can no longer, it's at risk of, of literally popping like a, like a water balloon that's getting overfilled. It will burst. There's an integrity to the membrane that's starting to get lost as it's expanding too much. And so in order to prevent further growth, the hypertrophic fat cell says to the hormone insulin, insulin, you are trying to make me bigger than I already am. I can't stop you from pushing stuff in, but you are stopping me from breaking fat down. And now I'm not going to let you do that anymore. To be a little more precise, insulin inhibits a process called lipolysis, which is the technical term for a fat cell breaking down its stored fat to share with the body. However, in this case, the big fat cell says to insulin, forget you, I can't keep this up and I'm gonna start breaking down fat anyway. So it becomes insulin resistant. And so you have a fat cell that stops growing. It doesn't shrink, but at least it stops growing, preventing it from popping, which would be a very big mess and very unhealthy. Now, at the same time that's happening, so one, the hypertrophic fat cell becomes insulin resistant to prevent further growth. But in the process, it starts leaking a lot of fats into the bloodstream. Wow. Second is that when the fat cell gets really, really big, they begin pushing each other further and further away from capillaries, which is the smallest unit of a blood vessel. And it's the capillary, you know, my fingers in this case, where we have things like oxygen and nutrients coming out of the blood 
And then the blood is receiving things like carbon dioxide or waste products, metabolites from the cells to be dumped from the body. And so that's the point where we are exchanging things, including oxygen with cells. But normally, a cell is just a few microns away from a capillary. However, as the fat cells get 10 times bigger than they used to be, they begin to push each other too far. So now you have fat cells that become what's called hypoxic, or to say that another way, they are suffocating. They can't get enough oxygen. And so they begin releasing these things called pro-inflammatory cytokines. Mm. Another way to say that is basically just a lot of little hormones that activate the inflammation processes in the body. And now you'd wonder why on earth is the fat cell becoming so pro-inflammatory? It's because some of those molecules that are being released stimulate a process called angiogenesis, which is a technical term for growing new capillaries. So enhancing the amount of blood vessels. And that is, of course, in an effort for this big fat cell that's been pushed too far from a capillary to return capillary blood flow and to get oxygen and to stop suffocating. But the systemic or the whole body consequence of this is that inflammation is up throughout the body, all because the big fat cell is suffocating. To kind of sum it all up and put a little bow on it, we have this really big fat cell who's just trying to survive. It becomes insulin resistant to prevent further growth, lest it explode, but in the process is flushing the body with all this fat that the body doesn't know what to do with in the blood, making it get stored in other tissues like the liver or the muscle make, or the pancreas causing fatty tissue problems. And two, as the hypertrophic fat cell gets pushed ever further from blood, it becomes hypoxic and is suffocating and is dumping the blood with these pro-inflammatory proteins, all in an effort to try to just live and continue to be able to breathe, if you will. But the consequence being that it's spreading this pro-inflammation throughout the body. And the combination of those two things, increased fats in the blood and increased inflammation is a wicked combination. It's a one-two punch that basically begins promoting the insulin resistance throughout the rest of the body. So if we stack up these dominoes in a row, the first one to get tipped over is the fat cell, and then it then is tipping into the rest, spreading the insulin resistance. Wow, that is incredible. You just taught me a ton, and you did a great job explaining that. I have so many questions for you now on this. First of all, people are thinking, well, those two roommates, I want to be that first guy. So is this genetic yeah. of how this happens or is there something yeah, that, in their lifestyle? That's a great question. Let me preface my answer by saying it sounds good if your only hope is to reduce the risk of those problems like hypertension and diabetes, which of course is something we would all want. But we have to counter that enthusiasm with the fact that people who genetically, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, have the ability to make new fat cells, also have the ability to get tremendously fat and are likely always fatter than other people are. So there is the downside to this. is It's this paradox where people who have the genetic ability to undergo fat cell hyperplasia yes, may have a lower risk of these chronic diseases um, because of ultimately better metabolic health, but paradoxically can get much, much fatter than other people can get because there's no limit. It doesn't start self-correcting. Whereas when cells are limited in number, they begin to limit their own growth by becoming insulin resistant. And so that's a person who reaches a cap, but the people who undergo hyperplasia have no cap. This is another concept, and I hate to complicate it, called the personal fat threshold. It's this sort of theoretical idea of every individual body has a threshold of fat that it doesn't want to go beyond when it comes to how much fat the body is storing. And someone who can only get fat through hypertrophy will have a limited fat threshold, and that any fat that the body is trying to store as insulin continues to push fat storage, once we reach that threshold, now we have problems if we try to push beyond it. And so we have a, a cap, a threshold with hypertrophy. But with hyperplasia, that threshold is really, really hard to reach. A person just gets fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. And then eventually, after they have twice as much body fat as they do total mass, which you know they've gotten to 350 or 400 pounds or 450 pounds or beyond, those kinds of people are unique. Most people could never get that fat. 
you know, like chances are you and I could never do that. If we just were eating as much as we could, spiking our insulin, getting tons of calories, you know, maybe you would tap out at 250, maybe I'd get to 300, but we literally, in fact, I probably even couldn't, we couldn't go any further than that, but we would have already gotten severe type two diabetes and hypertension and infertility. So as much as people will look at the first roommate and say, man, I want that. We don't really because then our ability to get fat is enormous. Now, just as a point of clarity, women tend to have a little more hyperplasia than men do. So whereas men are generally, because of sex and sex hormones, that entirely a function of sex hormones, men generally go through puberty, they're done and they're done. The number of fat cells they have is set. There are some exceptions to that where there are some men who genetically just have more hyperplasia, but women, due to sex hormones, have a little more tendency for hyperplasia, specifically at the bum and hips. That area of the body, much to every woman's chagrin, I was going to say, the, dang. I know, I know. That's the area of the body that has a little more hyperplasia, where if she will stop storing fat everywhere else, it would have reached its limit through hypertrophy. But if there's sort of a, an ongoing pressure to store more, she'll start making new fat cells there. But that does mean, or it does explain how a woman will invariably have more fat than her male counterpart, but be healthier because mm. her fat cells are smaller and thus are anti-inflammatory and insulin sensitive. And this is what we see. Women naturally have more fat than men do by design, and yet they're healthier and their risk of all of these cardiometabolic complications is much lower than in men. So interesting. So I want to talk about the differences between men and women and fat, but I have a few other questions first. So when you're talking about the two roommates, though, and genetics, lifestyle factors, though, play a huge role, right? It's not that you're doomed to this because of your genetics. Your lifestyle factors are going to play a huge piece of this, correct? Absolutely. I should have made that clear at the beginning of my sort of long answer. It was already long enough, so maybe I don't regret not doing it. But yeah, just because someone may have a genetic disposition for one or the other, a greater propensity for hyperplasia or a greater tendency towards hypertrophy, that does not mean that they have to go down those pathways. Absolutely not. As I have emphasized a couple times now, the hormone insulin reigns utterly and totally supreme. I don't want to complicate my answer and bring in this huge tangent, but you know, typically we have looked at fat gain purely through the lens of thermodynamics and calories. It's just how much energy coming in or out. Unfortunately, the human body is way more complicated. In fact, every cell is way more complicated than that. We're not this perfect kind of thermodynamic steam engine, which is the origins of the principles of thermodynamics in the first place. It's a principle of physics. Biology is a little messier. And the cell or the body, by extension, does not inherently know what to do with calories or energy that it has coming in. It has to be told what to do. And insulin is the main signal that tells the body to store energy, especially at fat cells. So even if you have, to answer the question explicitly, two people who are genetically going to be more inclined towards one pathway or the other, each of them can successfully fight that descent down that metabolic pathway by simply adopting a diet that helps keep their insulin low. And you and I touched on this a little bit in our first conversation, um, but this is why I'm such an advocate of a diet that very first step is control carbohydrates and, and basically refined starches and sugars. Unfortunately, we live in a culture where not only is the majority, I mean, in the global diet, about 70% of all calories are coming from carbohydrates, and that's mostly refined starches and sugars. And then we've been told to eat five or six times a day, and we have three big meals and we have three snacks in between the meals and something in the evening. And so the average individual is spending every waking moment in a state of elevated insulin and even well into their sleeping moments because of what they indulge in every evening. And thus, it's no surprise that there is this constant pressure on fat cells to just grow. And, and so the answer is, no, no one's ever doomed. It's really a matter of just keep your insulin under control. And if you do, fat cells will take care of themselves. There is literally no ability for the fat cells to either grow or proliferate and store more fat if insulin is kept at a low level. Wow. You know, when you're talking about this, I'm like, there's a huge mismarketing out there, miscommunication out there, because everything is calories in, calories out, where people should really be doing insulin levels to obtain the weight that they want. 
That is absolutely true. Yes. In, in an ideal world, uh, in fact, I'll preface that by saying, I think when biology and nutrition science invoked thermodynamics and the unit of energy of the calorie, I think it was one of the greatest mistakes in our understanding of metabolism. I think that should have no place in these conversations and it simply complicates it and makes it too confusing that rather than in an ideal world on that little nutrition label, whatever, it wouldn't have calories, it would have some like insulin score or, or even something called the glycemic load, which is a more quantified concept of just how much of what you're eating going to turn into blood glucose. And then of course, blood glucose will stimulate insulin that I would guarantee would be a much more effective approach. And maybe just to wrap this up in a nice tidy way so people can understand some of my frustration, especially frustration coming from the problem with doggedly counting calories is the advice is always, as you just said, eat less, exercise more. That is the advice we've been giving to people for decades now, 50 or 60 years, and it's clearly not working. I mean, we are fatter now than we were last year. In fact, COVID accelerated it even in, in kids and adults all being locked at home and just sitting around and eating all day. But I'm not suggesting calories don't matter. Energy does matter. My PhD is bioenergetics. I have an appreciation for energy that probably outpaces most even other scientists. But I appreciate energy in the context of a biological system, which is more complicated than a perfect thermodynamic steam engine, for example, again. But in the case of calories and the problem with it, let's imagine that, that you know, you and I, Carolyn and Ben are having this big buffet that we're hosting and all of the audience is invited to come. And we have hired the best chefs who are preparing the most delicious snacks and meals that anyone could ever imagine. So the invitation is to come and come hungry. My question to the audience and think about this, what would you do to make sure you came to our buffet, our dinner? as hungry as possible. I suspect you would do two things. One, in the days preceding the event, you would eat a little less. And in the days preceding the event, you would exercise a little more. And it would work perfectly. You would come to our dinner and as hungry as you possibly could. But that's exactly why eat less, exercise more does not work for long-term weight loss. It's not that energy doesn't matter, but if your first step on a weight loss journey is to immediately restrict energy and not address insulin, which is trying to tell your body just to store and store and store energy, the overall amount of energy available for you to now burn for your brain to use that's coming from the blood is significantly reduced. This is very well established in human studies from a collaborator of mine out of Harvard. If the first step is low energy and you've not addressed the high insulin that's wanting your body to store the energy, you are going to be waging war with hunger and hunger always wins. wins. And so your short-term weight loss is doomed to fail, which is one reason why on the game show, The Biggest Loser, you never see a reunion tour a year or two later because <laughs> they all gain it back. Once that horrific environment and the flagellation, the, the whipping of their coaches is gone, hunger wins and they start eating the same way they did before. So you have to have an approach that allows you to eat when you're hungry, not eat when you're not hungry, but allow insulin to come down. Now, all of a sudden you can start to use your own energy in your body, namely the energy that's stored in your fat cells, but you cannot do that till insulin is reduced. So interesting. We could have a whole show just on weight loss and insulin, but I'm going to ask you some other questions. Going back to men and women and how we store it differently, how does this affect us health-wise? And you talked a little bit about the hormones being the cause of this. So explain more. Is this the estrogen in women that's causing us to store fat differently? Is this a health concern for us? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so the differences in how men and women store fat are entirely a result of sex hormones. And men and women are, of course, very, very different. We are very different bodies with tremendously different biochemistry and endocrinology. And to pretend otherwise is just very wrong. And an attempt to mess with that, we're dealing with very, very powerful processes. So when you look at a little boy and a little girl, they look the same. Their body type, I mean, if you just cover them, put a little diaper on them, and you wouldn't know who you're looking at, a boy or a girl. 
once they go through puberty, however, the changes are very apparent. Where the little girl starts to look like her mom, the little boy starts to look more like dad, just a bigger version of his own body. The changes aren't quite as substantial, perhaps. But that is totally a result of sex hormones and estrogens, which is a, you know, estrogens is the plural form for this sort of this uh, little cluster of the prototypical female hormones, like estradiol being the main one. Um, people typically just refer to estradiol as estrogen, mm -hmm. which is fine, but it's not totally accurate. Right. The estrogens will tell her body to store fat on, on breasts, hips, and buttocks, typically. You know, those are the prototypical female areas, and it's estrogens that tell her body where to store that fat. However, testosterone doesn't really have that same effect, and the general fat storage in a high testosterone, lower estrogens body is to store it more centrally. But this is reflected in a woman who goes through menopause. When she is losing her estrogens, she starts to default to this, if you will, male pattern. And if she continues to gain fat mass after menopause, she will gain it more centrally. And she'll generally not store as much on breasts, hips, and buttocks. But at the same time, not only do the estrogens stimulate the placement of the fat, or where we're storing fat, but it will also affect the nature of those fat cells, namely giving the fat cells a little more ability towards hyperplasia. And that's the process, of course, we referred to earlier, where it's the estrogens in the female that are allowing the fat cells to multiply, to store more fat. And, and that is very likely just the reality of dealing with a body that has the potential to become pregnant. If a woman is storing a lot of her fat in her stomach area, her abdominal area, like her male counterpart is, uh, then that would make it very difficult for her to also store a baby there that is growing bigger and bigger and bigger all of the time. It could create a physical limitation on her ability to, to reproduce and to grow that baby full term. And so by storing her fat on her buttocks and hips, it's out of the way, if you will. It wouldn't be impacting the area of the fetus, which is her, you know, whether we want to admit it or not, I mean, the purpose of every life form is to reproduce to some degree or another. I mean, at least the theory of evolution states that, you know, explicitly, and even those of religious bent would say, yeah, it's important to reproduce. So it's no surprise that both male and female bodies have adapted in a way or were created in a way to make sure that there was as little disruption to reproduction as possible. And so I strongly submit the reason the female stores the fat where she does, where she stores it is to help protect her ability to get pregnant. Her ability to produce more fat cells, I think is also an adaptation or a design mechanism to help her have a little more fat because her body, I don't mean for this to sound derogatory, but it bears the metabolic burden of reproduction. The male, of course, is utterly essential to reproduction, but it's a wonderful flash in the pan moment. And his <laughs> part for the next nine months is just a support role. Now, I submit it's a very important one and even more important after that. But even still, it's her body that has to constantly be checking itself and saying, OK, I'm about to commit to a metabolic marathon. And this little baby growing in me is going to consume a tremendous amount of my energy. In fact, a woman who gets pregnant will have the highest metabolic rate of her whole life while she's pregnant hmm. um, because she her body is working so hard and it includes the metabolic rate of an entirely separate individual in her womb. And so her, it's her body's way of saying, do I have enough fat? Do I have enough energy to actually do this and commit to this? And that's why a woman who's too lean won't be fertile because it's actually all through the hormone leptin, um, not to go on a super crazy tangent, but it's leptin coming from fat cells that provides the signal to the brain, which would then provide the signal to the ovaries of whether or not the body should be reproducing. So if she has enough fat, she has enough leptin, and that allows the body to be fertile. If she doesn't have enough fat, there's not enough leptin, and then fertility stops. Anyway, I've gotten off on a tangent, but it is sex hormones that dictate where we store fat and to a degree how. Now, having said all of that, even within the sexes, there are different genetic abilities that would, you know, there are some men that do have greater hyperplasia than other men. There are some women who have slightly less hyperplasia capacity than other women. So that all is very natural. Part of that is ethnic, you know, South Asians and Southeast Asians and even North Asians have a very limited potential for hyperplasia, whereas blacks and European Caucasians have a much higher degree of hyperplasia on average 
So there's a lot of nuance across all of the spectrum, but specifically within the sexes, women have more hyperplasia than men, and that's largely a sex hormone driven phenomenon. Okay, so I have a question about women and men, because you said that men tend to store it in the central region and women, as they go through menopause, that's where it tends to go. But you always hear that that's like the most dangerous fat. Is that true? Are there different fats that are more at risk than others and the location matters? Location matters. Absolutely. Just like it is with real estate, it is with where we store fat, location, location, location. And specifically, it's whether it, we could break up fat. There are a number of ways to classify fat tissue. One way is based on location. Specifically, is it underneath the skin, which is called subcutaneous, or is it tucked within the central abdominal cavity? and then it's called visceral fat. So visceral fat is fat that is accumulating around the intestines, around the kidneys, all of that central area within the abdominal cavity, mm. which is not the same as storing fat on your belly or the outside of it. And even if we're just looking at someone's belly, you could, we've all seen this. Imagine two different men and they're at their water park, no shirt on, reveling in their chubby bodies. Um, because men are generally so indifferent to these <laughs> kinds of things. Blessedly so. It's a survival mechanism. And take that from a guy who lost his hair at 20. You know, we, we have these coping mechanisms to think that we are more attractive than we really are. So you have one guy, and they're both chubby, but one guy's belly sticks out, and it is really hard and firm, but it's really big. The other guy has a belly which has just as much fat on it, but it's dangling down in a bunch of rolls that you could jiggle and pinch, whereas the other one you can't really pinch. It's very hard and firm. That guy whose fat is protruding and it's hard and firm has more of his fat behind his muscles of his abdomen, or in other words, within that abdominal cavity. That is visceral fat, whereas the other guy has most of his fat as subcutaneous, the pinchable, jiggable fat. That fat is healthier fat. Storing fat in the subcutaneous space, just beneath the skin, is healthier. It tends to be more insulin sensitive. It produces more of a good hormone called adiponectin, and it produces more of these anti-inflammatory cytokines. So really acting to try to keep inflammation in check. Whereas visceral fat is not like that we tend to get fat there much more often by hypertrophy. And we don't want to store fat in the visceral space limitlessly, because if we continue to store more fat, we could begin to literally compress the intestines or literally pinch off the kidneys. And mm. so it would cause a great deal of harm. And so that fat undergoes hypertrophy much more readily, because remember, if fat cells grow through hypertrophy, they limit their own growth. And so visceral fat is much more pro-inflammatory and much more prone to causing insulin resistance than subcutaneous fat. And women tend to have more subcutaneous fat than men. But of course, once she starts to go through menopause and continues to gain fat, if she does, then she would start to store fat more in the visceral space, which is why once a woman goes through menopause, all of a sudden, her being as fat or fatter than her male counterpart starts to have consequences. Her risk of diabetes starts to skyrocket and hypertension and heart disease. And so I am prone to say, when a woman goes through menopause, she loses her metabolic superpowers, where she is no longer protected from fat mass to a great degree. And she is premenopausal. Now she is as subject to the consequences of fat as her male counterpart is. Well, that's a rough time of life for women. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Well, mind you, <laughs> mind you, all, all it is is putting her on an even playing field with the man. You know, so all right. she has been here <laughs> enjoying this protection. And then all of a sudden she's just she's mortal you know, is another way of saying it. She's just the average person. She loses that metabolic superpower. But yeah, I mean, it's certainly an adjustment, but it doesn't become worse than men just to set the record straight. <laughs> Okay, so if people are listening to this and they're like, okay, my husband has visceral fat or I have visceral fat, it goes back to what we were saying. The best way to get rid of that fat is to keep those insulin and glucose levels more balanced throughout the day, correct? Absolutely, yeah. And, and so in addition to just answering that with a resounding yes, I could elaborate just briefly. It, it is this focus on insulin that I believe anyone who wants to lose weight, you know, if you look down the journey of weight loss, and I'd already mentioned this first step on in many people's minds, the first step is always the low energy step. But if, if you have high insulin levels because you're overweight and you're insulin resistant, you do 
stimulate more hunger that way. And, and so it's going to be a very short lived destination. And before you know it, you find yourself right back at the beginning of the path again. So the first step should always be, I'm going to reduce my insulin. I'm not going to worry about energy at all. I'm going to keep that foot firmly in place. That's not moving yet. Yet. Uh, my first step is going to be reducing my insulin. And there are three simple ideas that I believe people can implement. Now, they're simple as an idea, but that does not mean they're easy to do because anytime you start talking about changing habits, you're right. talking about addictions. And we just learned, you know, with, I, I don't want to get too religious, but you know, general conference, we heard this message about addiction to food. That was one of the final comments made and it's a very real thing. So I don't mean to imply that these are easy to do. It's hard. And so we recruit help, get friends and family to help you make these changes. But to take that first step of reducing insulin, Keep three things in mind, control carbohydrates. So focus on fruits and vegetables. Be, be careful with, with grains and refined starches and sugars and anything that they may be kind of packaged into. It's the carbohydrates that's going to be the biggest stimulus on insulin. Second, prioritize protein. Make sure you're getting good, high quality protein. And generally that's going to mean animal protein. And I know you have a protein supplement that looks great, but prioritize protein, make sure you're getting enough protein. But at the same time, make sure you're getting enough fat. So my third rule is don't fear fat. Fat helps the body digest protein. Too often we just prioritize the protein and we fail to realize that in nature, protein never comes alone. Protein always comes with fat. In nature, there is literally no exception to this. We've created the exception because of our fear of fat. But anytime you're getting protein, don't fear the fat that would come with that protein. It will help you digest the protein better and it stimulates greater muscle and bone growth when they're consumed together than alone. So control carbs, prioritize protein, don't fear fat. Now that takes care of the first low insulin step and that will result in a tremendous and rapid weight loss. And for many people that's enough and they need never go any further. That first step of just lowering insulin gets them to where they want to get with their, on their weight loss journey. However, if some people find they've lost weight and now they've plateaued, now that insulin is low and you've trained your body to use its own fat for energy. In other words, you're accessing the energy stored in your own fat cells. Now we can look, take that next step of controlling energy, but lest we think I am advocating counting calories, I am not. I believe the best way to now start to rein in energy is to frequently fast. And that is my fourth pillar here of all of these. Now you get into the realm of intermittent fasting and structured fasting, whether you're doing an 18, six where you're fasting through breakfast and maybe just having a cup of tea or something, or whether you're doing a five, two, where you fast 24 hours, twice, two times each week, you know, and that's just fasting from calories. You're still drinking water and electrolytes and vitamins, um, but just no calories coming in. And there are num any number of ways to engage in intermittent fasting, but that is my view on the best way to control energy. But one last comment on that is how you end your fast is more important than how long you fast. Hmm. Many people who engage in intermittent fasting just jump in and say, I'm going to do a 36 hour fast because I saw an influencer do this and they, they get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. And then once the fast ends, even if they get that long, they binge and they just eat all the salty, crunchy stuff or sweet and gooey stuff. And their glucose levels spike, their insulin levels go up 20 times and they feel sick. They have a lot of shame, a lot of regret, and all they do then is resolve to do better tomorrow. And then they just get into this. So in many instances, and, and pardon the kind of vulgar way of saying it, I fear that intermittent fasting becomes a bit of a, a, a kind of a version of bulimia where it's a, a binge purge cycle of fasting, 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 binging, 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 fasting, fast, and it's a bunch of shame. And so that's my point on how you end your fast matters way more than how long you fast. So have a specific plan in mind. I'm going to fast for 24 hours and this is exactly what I'm going to eat and recruit help. Tell your spouse or a family member or friend say, can you please help me stop? And, and then maybe, maybe you don't even not eat anything else. You just say, I'm only going to eat this. And then if I need something two hours later, then I can have something else. 
but it's just when we don't really have a plan and we just binge, binge, binge is the worst way to engage in intermittent fasting where it just becomes a bit of a glamorous eating disorder. So control carbs, prioritize protein, don't fear fat and frequently fast. That to me are the simple, most effective interventions in order to reduce insulin and subsequently get your fat mass under control or never let it get out of control. Wow, those are really great doable steps. So thank you for explaining all of those. I know the listeners are like, oh, thank you for giving me action steps that I can go do. But I want to talk to you a little bit because I've got such a huge female following. I want to talk to you a little bit about infertility and PCOS because I know that fat plays a role in this and people listening might be like, what? And so I'm pretty sure that it's the fat um, as we talked about how it causes so many inflammation issues, that this can contribute to the PCOS or infertility issues. Will you expound upon that? Oh, yes. Yes, gladly. <clears throat> so I am of the mind that we shouldn't even call PCOS by that name. We shouldn't say it's polycystic ovary syndrome because all that does is tell you that there are cysts in the ovaries and it doesn't tell you where the problem is coming from. I think if we name a problem, it should help us understand it rather than just the consequences of it. And, and so I think we should call it metabolic infertility. And there is in fact a movement to change that name among OBGYNs and fertility specialists. May it happen sooner than later. But yeah, insulin resistance is the most common cause of PCOS in women, and PCOS is itself the most common cause of infertility. So it's prudent for us to talk about it because it just impacts so many women. Um, and it does, once again, start at the fat tissue. Insulin reigns supreme. I mean, of all the hormones in the body, there are few that can match the overall impact of insulin. And that is reflected in the fact that literally every single cell of the body has what's called insulin receptors. It is these little doorways built into the surface of the cell that insulin can come and knock on and then tell the cell to do something. Again, every single cell of the body has these. And there are few hormones that can impact every single cell of the body. Insulin is one of this very, very small um, collection. Now, insulin will tell different cells to do different things. That's not surprising. One of the effects of insulin in the ovaries, in the theca and granulosa cells, it's these two cells that work together to produce sex hormones in the ovaries, insulin inhibits an enzyme called aromatase. Aromatase is the enzyme within the ovaries and in the testes too. Men have this happen too, albeit to a much, much lower level. Aromatase is the enzyme that is responsible for converting testosterone, you know, the prototypical androgen, the prototypical male hormone, which again is present in men and women, just higher levels of men, that converts testosterone into the estrogens, into estradiol and the other estrogens. But it is all that one little mediator. If aromatase isn't working, we're not converting testosterone to estrogen. So all estrogens were once testosterone. It was just aromatase that mediated that, that flipped that switch. Unfortunately, insulin tends to provide an inhibitory signal on aromatase. Mm. So insulin's always trying to shut off aromatase. Maybe because if insulin's really high, it doesn't want the lady to begin reproducing because that's insulin's way of saying, you're not metabolically healthy, don't do this. Regardless of the why, we know that that happens. And so if you take a body that has insulin resistance, as we defined insulin resistance in our first episode together, part of it is one, that some cells of the body aren't responding well to insulin, but two, it's that insulin levels are chronically elevated or a condition called hyperinsulinemia. And that's a problem, particularly to the cells that are still insulin sensitive, like the cells of the ovaries. So now all of this insulin in the blood is coming to the ovary and inhibiting aromatase, which is directly preventing her body from having this really big estrogen spike. And if you can't get that really big estrogen spike, you don't get that really big LH and FSH spike from the brain, the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone. And now you have ovaries that were able to trigger some of the kind of primordial oocytes or eggs but never so you have in a normal fertility cycle in an ovulatory cycle the ovaries will have some number of eggs that start to grow they're getting a little stimulated throughout that cycle and then you have this really big surge of these of estrogens and lh and that basically triggers one of the ovaries normally one of the eggs 
normally to become the dominant follicle and then to actually come to the edge of the ovary and ovulate or actually release the egg down the fallopian tubes. However, if you don't have that big estrogen spike and you don't have the LH spike as a result, you have follicles that are growing, but you never get that surge for one to become the dominant mm. and end up ovulating. So you have all of these partially formed oocytes, partially developed, that now have nowhere to go. They didn't, because it's only when one of them ovulates and you have that remaining structure within the um, ovary that then tells all of the other developing eggs to go away, to get degraded. It's basically that one egg saying, hey guys, I won this race, you guys can all go home. And they just get degraded and kind of reabsorbed into the ovaries. But it only happens if you have one of them become dominant and ovulate. So to put this all up in a kind of sequential series of events, the high insulin prevents the estrogens and LH surge, which prevents ovulation, which prevents all of the other follicles going away. Now all the follicles remain and become cysts. Wow. And so you have the ovary that can become really, really, really big. I mean, it can become substantially expanded in size, all because insulin was too high. Now, I'd started to mention one particular study. Now, some people hearing this may say, well, Ben, I have PCOS and I'm normal weight. I'm not overweight. I don't fit the profile of someone with insulin resistance. A fascinating study was published a number of years ago that took women with PCOS and without and matched them for body weight and still found that even though they were the same body weight, the women with PCOS had demonstrably more insulin resistance in their fat cells. That even if the insulin resistance wasn't reflected at the whole body level, I would say yet, it was reflected in the earliest tissue that becomes insulin sensitive, resistant, specifically the fat tissue. So wow. even though a woman might not fit the profile, even still, it is still likely a consequence of her insulin resistance. Wow, that is really interesting. Thank you for explaining all that. So again, it comes down to your four actionable steps of how to lower the insulin so that they can have a greater chance of possibly getting pregnant. That's exactly right. Yeah, and there are some case reports that have been published. There's one clinic out of Duke University in North Carolina that published a case report on eight women with PCOS and ongoing inability to get pregnant. And after just a dietary intervention of a few months, something like three or four of the eight got pregnant and all of them had significant reductions in, of course, their insulin levels and their free testosterone, their estrogens went up. And, and so everything appeared to be getting on track all because they were lowering their insulin levels and making the body more insulin sensitive. Okay. That is fascinating about women and PCOS and all of that with the cortisol and fat cells. But I have a question besides PCOS and infertility. It can affect women's hormones throughout the month, the fat cells and the insulin, right? If our insulin's too high, like you said, all those things are going to mess with, it could mess with the estrogen progesterone ratios, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah well, it certainly can. Yeah. So even progesterone, of course, is along this same sex hormone pathway, although it takes a different route than the estrogens do from testosterone, where it's not as dependent on aromatase. So absolutely, if a woman has is insulin resistant and has high insulin levels, her progesterone can still move as we might expect, um, but estrogens won't. So that absolutely will affect the ratio. But I wanna just flip it around for a moment by saying how even in a healthy ovulatory cycle, as much as we've been talking about how insulin's affecting and insulin resistance is affecting sex hormone production, sex hormones in turn affect insulin resistance and specifically progesterone. Progesterone is a hormone that actually creates a little bit of insulin resistance in the woman's body and it increases hunger in the woman's body. And so when a woman is after her ovulatory phase where her progesterone levels spike or in the ovulatory phase, or no luteal phase it's called, right after she's ovulated for a couple days, she may notice that she's hungrier and that and even a little hotter. Metabolic rate has gone up, but she's also become a little more insulin resistant for those couple days because of what it, progesterone does. Progesterone is the hormone of gestation. It is progestation. It is the hormone that is essential to her body starting to change in order to facilitate the growth of the, of the baby and the subsequent feeding of the baby after birth. And pregnancy is 
one of the very, very few states in the, in the course of a human's life where a person has what's called physiological insulin resistance. In other words, her body becomes insulin resistant on purpose. It's serving a purpose. And in the case of pregnancy, it's serving a purpose of growth. Because if insulin is really high, like it is with insulin resistance, it's helping her body get a little fatter, you know, as much as she may not enjoy it. It's helping the baby get fatter and bigger. It's helping her mammary tissue get ready for lactation and a host of other effects. All of it is, however, a part of her body becoming more insulin resistant. I mean, every trimester, take a perfectly healthy insulin sensitive woman, and even through a perfectly healthy pregnancy, her insulin resistance will be going up and up and up, and it's supposed to happen. And then the moment she gives birth, boom, it goes right back down to normal. It's only when in these few instances, increasingly common though, that her physiological insulin resistance goes too far and now becomes pathological insulin resistance, generally because of how she's eating, that now her insulin levels, even though they're higher, can no longer keep her glucose levels in check. And now she steps from normal, healthy insulin resistance of pregnancy into the harmful insulin resistance of gestational diabetes. So gestational diabetes is simply the insulin resistance of pregnancy that's gone too far. Now, I realize I've totally flipped this whole discussion around a little bit, but yes, insulin continues to have ongoing effects on sex hormone production. But just so people are aware, in the wonderful complication of the female body and metabolism, it also can be flipped around where sex hormones are having a direct impact even throughout the month on her metabolic status. Oh, interesting. So again, best thing to do is the four actionable steps that we talked about to help balance those hormones in both directions. That solution is one, those, those sort of pithy, mnemonic, easy to remember steps are very well thought out. And, and I've tried to imagine every scenario, but it is simply a testament to how relevant insulin resistance is. This is why, you know, when I started to crystallize these thoughts and think, I believe there's something valuable here. Uh, how can I share them? And then when I, I put together my book, Why We Get Sick, it was intended to just create this kind of cohesive view of chronic disease, what I like to refer to as the plagues of prosperity or these diseases of civilization. Why is it that we're dying from heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, fatty liver disease, and we're infertile, whereas two generations ago, no one was really worried about these problems. They were so uncommon. It's largely because of how we eat, what we eat and how frequently we eat it, and the consequence of that stem causing insulin resistance, and then insulin resistance being the root of almost every chronic disease. So imagine someone who's opening their medicine cabinet, and every day they're taking a, a medication for their type 2 diabetes, a medication for their hypertension, and a medication for their infertility, realizing that if I just make some lifestyle changes to improve one part of my health, namely my insulin resistance, I can very likely, with my doctor's supervision, get off every single one of those medications. I have seen it happen. I've published reports on this phenomenon of just reversing chronic disease in people where the clinician is having to de-prescribe medications from their patient, which of course is life-changing, but it is all a reflection of the fact that so much of chronic disease can be distilled to one central problem. And if we address that problem, then we begin to improve the risk of all the chronic diseases. Okay, as we wrap up here, let me ask you something about that because you hear quite often out there, inflammation is the root cause of all disease. You know, inflammation is why you've got the chronic migraines or the chronic fatigue or the autoimmune issue or depression, anxiety, all these things. But in reality, you would take that one step further then and say, no, it's the insulin resistance causing the inflammation, which is contributing to those other diseases, correct? Absolutely. I would put them together. And, and just so people know that I'm not speaking with some false authority here, looking at inflammation and its metabolic consequences was the whole focus of, uh, of my fellowship with Duke Medical School. When I did my postdoctoral fellowship, it was all exploring this. So I'm very familiar with this topic. So first of all, inflammation, I do believe is directly blamed for too many problems, but that is not to say 
there aren't some problems that are relevant, especially any kind of autoimmune disease, like what we often can refer to as a hypersensitivity reaction, that's all inflammation related. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. We don't need to go any further. There are other issues like of people with intestinal sensitivities, something I know you've really focused on. There's no question we can consume things that make our gut inflamed and which contributes to leaky gut, which is a very real thing. And then of course, if the gut is leaking molecules, allowing things to get through that shouldn't be getting through into the bloodstream, no surprise that directly contributes to inflammation. But when we look at most of these chronic diseases, not in every case, but in many of them, inflammation is one of the three cardinal causes of insulin resistance. And so if I am neatly connecting, say, inflammation as a cause of heart disease, I would say, yeah, it's inflammation, which is then causing insulin resistance. And then it's insulin resistance that is resulting in the narrowing of blood vessels or the dyslipidemia. That's not a consequence of inflammation per se. So in many instances, the inflammation alone can be contributing to the problem, but I would say just as often, if not more often, it's the inflammation causing insulin resistance, and then it's the insulin resistance acting as the actual mediator of the disease. But again, inflammation is one of the three cardinal causes of insulin resistance. Well, now I'm curious to know what the other two are. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I knew I'd <laughs> lured you in. Yeah, the other two, Inflammation, and then the next one is stress in no particular order. Stress is on its own, once again, a cardinal cause and, and an independent cause, meaning it is capable of causing insulin resistance in the absence of any other signal, just like inflammation is. And stress is, when I say stress, I mean an elevation in the two stress hormones, these poster child hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. Those are the two stress hormones. And anytime they're elevated, the body's going to become insulin resistant as a result. Now of those two, the more relevant one is cortisol because epinephrine or adrenaline is just usually up and down, whereas cortisol can be up higher for longer, especially in a case of sleep deprivation. That is very relevant. Now of those two though, I believe they're less relevant than the third be because on one hand, it's harder to kind of quantify them it's harder to know, am I inflamed or am I stressed? And it's hard to reduce them. You know, even if you tell someone we have a lot of inflammation, you have a lot of stress, how do you monitor that? How do you improve it? Not that they don't matter. They do absolutely. But they're just, if we imagine a wall with three big levers on them and each of the levers are turned on and that's contributing to someone's insulin resistance, the inflammation and the stress lever are really slippery. It's not that it's impossible to pull them down, but it's just a little hard. The third and final one is the one I focus on the most, and that is chronically elevated insulin itself. Too much insulin drives insulin resistance. And that is reflective of a fundamental biological principle where I could say too much of something will cause a resistance to that something. This is reflected across all of biology. Insulin is no exception. We can measure it really, really well through a blood test. And if someone has high insulin, we know exactly how to improve it. We say just put in less glucose into the system because it's the glucose that's driving up the insulin levels. So all of those three are relevant. They each contribute to insulin resistance to varying degrees. I just believe the chronically elevated insulin, or to say that more precisely, the hyperinsulinemia is the most important of all of them because we know how to improve it so well. That is a lever, back to that metaphor, that we can grab firmly and pull it down immediately. This is why when someone follows those four pillars of intervention to lower their insulin, they often have to start dropping certain medications within just days. Wow. Their, their, their improvements in their body become so substantial that they need to keep in touch with their clinical team because they may have to change their hypertension medications within almost a day or two. They have to change their anti-diabetic medications and more and more and more because it's so effective. That's why I harp on that one the most, but all three are relevant. They all matter to varying degrees. It's just a bigger bang for our buck to focus on the last of them. Wow. Thank you for explaining that. You do a great job of making complex science very understandable and relatable. So thank you very much for explaining it like that. Our time is up and I have so many more questions that I can ask you, but I have to ask you one last question because I had a lot of followers want this question answered. And if I don't ask you, I know they're going to then get after me for not asking you. <laughs> so 
There is this trendy thing right now on social media as well that a problem with being overweight or large fat cells is that the fat cells store toxins. And that can be a concern with our health as well. Is this true, a myth? What are your thoughts? So it is true. Yeah, I won't try to take a political answer like of a non-answer. There's no question fat cells have the ability to accumulate fat soluble or lipid soluble um, molecules that are harmful to the body. And that's how I, the word toxin is sometimes a little overused. You know, as a scientist, I really want precision. And what sometimes people say, oh, that's toxic. It's not really toxic, but there are molecules that are where they come into the body and they have no role except a harmful role that I consider toxic. And this happens, molecules we breathe, molecules we, we swallow, even some that get through our skin can in fact accumulate in fat cells and they have to be dealt with where if we start breaking down a fat cell, we're burning fat and releasing the fat cell shrinking, we will share some of those toxins get released into the blood. Now they need to, in order to get out of the body, whether it's through the kidneys or through the liver, those are the main areas of exiting something from the body. We need to get them out at some point. But you know, my work, for example, I have a collaboration uh, with a fellow, a colleague here at BYU named Paul Reynolds. We have studies that we've been doing looking at how diesel exhaust particles that we inhale from com diesel combustion can accumulate in fat cells, activating inflammation, making the fat cells insulin resistant, and then later potentially getting released back into the bloodstream as the fat cells shrink. So it, it certainly is a reason to be careful with what we put in our mouth and certainly be very careful with a lot of what we see in the grocery store and just what the water we're drinking. I mean, I hate to make people overly paranoid, but you know what we're drinking, what is the plastic? Cause those molecules, BPA will accumulate in fat cells. Is this good plastic if it's plastic at all? And there are some that are good or better than others, or, you know, what am I breathing? So I, I hate, again, I hate to make people become kind of hypochondriac with all right, this stuff. Same. There's only so much you can do. Right. And there's only so much effect it has even in the first place, but to make the answer very clear, yes, no question. A lot of these harmful molecules can, in fact, accumulate in fat cells. That's absolutely true. Okay. Thank you for answering that. That could be a whole nother podcast, you yeah. know, talking about how we eliminate it and stuff like that. But I just needed to ask that. Thank you so much for being here today. I know the listeners have learned so much. Remind the listeners where they can find you to get more information. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thanks again. This is always such a treat for me. Yeah, I'm pretty active on social media where I try to make little video snippets or share articles a, a couple times a week. It's never really personal. It's just me teaching a little lesson on human metabolism. And people can find me on social media channels at Ben Bickman PhD. And Bickman is just spelled B-I-K-M-A-N, no C, Ben Bickman PhD. And I, I mentioned my book, um, anyone who wants to learn more about insulin resistance, I wrote the authoritative, but easy to digest, very palatable guide. And that's why we get sick available anywhere, especially online, anywhere books are sold. And then also I'm just starting an educational platform of my own called Insulin IQ. And so that'll be a real kind of a repository of a lot of talks that I give or podcasts from time to time and just um, other weekly lessons about metabolism. So that's where people can find me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You guys, if you don't follow him, you are so interesting to watch on Instagram because I do love seeing the studies that you found and you'll be like, this is a brand new study or you take mm -hmm. complex studies and make them really relatable. So thank you for everything that you're teaching on Instagram. I really appreciate it. And as you know, I always end my podcast with asking my guests what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. And so I'm going to ask you again, even though you've answered it once, do you have a second ingredient? Yeah, I, you know, I, thankfully, I don't remember what I answered the first time. If I answered the same way, it's just a testament to how important I think it is. <clears throat> My ingredient to being, you know, middle-aged, married with kids and busy at church and work is a, a mantra, a mantra that I will cite to myself or just really keep it in my mind. But it is absolutely a secret ingredient for me. And that is to take my duties seriously, but not myself. And, and that is really reflected in how I look at my obligations and how seriously I take them, but also acknowledging the foibles and flaws of humanity, my own and others, where it allows me to laugh at my mistakes and it allows me to laugh at the mistakes of others, but not in a mocking way, but to invite people into that view of acknowledging humanity. 
and this kind of chaotic world we live in. So take your duties seriously, but not yourself. And, and to say that another way, you know, you have things you need to do, do them. But when there are opportunities to be a little lighthearted and to laugh and have a tender moment in that humor, uh, acknowledge it and embrace it. I love that. It must be a testament because that's very similar to what you said last time. So that is ah, good, what you good. must live. So thank you so much for being here. You are such a wealth of knowledge, spreading so much great education, not just to your students, but to all of us who are like students to you. And so thank you for all that you are sharing. My pleasure. This was great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus, get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram. <laughs>